Hello, everybody. Ready for a quiz on literary criticism? Remember, yesterday we had discussed a lot of important authors and works, areas from literary criticism. Today, we are continuing from there. Remember, yesterday's quiz was based on the beginnings. So today, our quiz will continue to talk about the Greco-Roman period. Come and join us, everybody. I'm a little early today because of my enthusiasm. How many of you really like literary criticism? Well, literary criticism is not uh, necessary to understand and enjoy literature. But if you know literary criticism, you will have a greater command over your reading, isn't it? Hi, everyone. Meher, Upasana, Zais, how are you all? Guys, literary criticism looks very challenging for some people. But if you get hold of the right books, you will be able to deal with it easily. How do you get the right books? Always look at the reading list given in the syllabi and try to get hold of those books. Spend some money, buy those books, and that will save your life. In net and set, questions come from the prescribed books in the syllabi. I don't mean the primary text alone. I also mean the secondary reading list in the syllabi. I'm fine, everybody. Thank you. And also, guys, uh, in literary terms, glossaries. There are write-ups on criticism and critical terms. That is also very important. If you really read three or four literary terms books thoroughly, Emma J. Brahms, J. A. Cadden, Chris Baldick, etc., you will have a real good knowledge of every basic thing in literature. To get our net books, bodhitreepublications.org. That is the website. Pramod K. Nair sir's book is very good. But Pramod K. Nair sir's book is not everything. There are other books with other information. If possible, always read a few books. All our Bodhitri books are made with information from several books. Our encyclopedias, what about theory? All these books contain material from several books. Okay. Net books that we have read, I have written, you can get from bodhitreepublications.org. That is our website. Okay. All right, uh, we are also posting in the chat box the link. Please check out the link in the live chat. Guys, let me share my screen and we will continue with this amazing quiz. Based on Unit 8, Literary Criticism. Identify the correct statement about the function of poetry in ancient Greece. Identify the correct statement. Poetry presented a vision of the world, of gods. Poetry was a repository of collective wisdom. Poetry was the expression of universalized myth. Tell me, which of these is true? Poetry presented a vision of the world of gods. Is it true? Poetry presented a collective wisdom. Is it true? Poetry was the expression of universalized myth. Is it true? What do you think? What do you think? It is all are true, of course. Poetry presented a vision of the world. 
poetry present at collective wisdom. That is the uh, meaning of poetry in ancient Greece, isn't it? Very good. All are true. Okay, next question. Much of Plato's philosophy is generated by a yo. Accidentally, I showed the answer. Much of Plato's philosophy is generated by a desire to impose order on chaos and to ground. So order is important in Plato. And to ground our thinking about morality, politics, and religion on timeless and universal truths. Is this true? Is this true? Yes, it is true. Plato's philosophy has a desire to impose order on chaos. Our morality, politics, etc. should be based on universal truths. Did you understand? Very important. Now, Plato had devised a dialectical method. Plato had devised a dialectical method of systematic question and answer to put forward his ideas of philosophy, theory, and criticism. Is it true or false? Did Plato put forward a dialectical method of systematic question and answer? True or false? Yes, this dialectical method matlab kya hai? What is dialectical method? Like Hegel said, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Dialectical method is a method of conflict. Plato's dialectical method is a method of conflict. Question and answer method, conflicting, disturbing people. It is true. Dialectical method was used by Socrates. Dialectical method is related to what is called Socratic irony. Isn't it, guys? Very good. Very good. So, you know that now. Who said that Western philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato? Footnote to Aristotle nahi bolega. Virgil bhi nahi bolega. In the time of Aristotle and Virgil. Footnotes were not there. It is Professor A. N. Whitehead. Professor A. N. Whitehead famously said, Western philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. Good evening, everybody. We are looking at some very important aspects of uh, ancient criticism now. Who was hailed by the oracle at Delphi as the wisest man alive? Who was, talked, uh, who was uh, called the wisest man alive? Was it Socrates? Was it Plato, Aristotle, Horace? It is Socrates who was hailed as the wisest man alive. Did you, were you thinking, is it Plato? Is it Aristotle? Is it Horace? No, 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 it is Socrates. Where one can find the, where can one find the in inscription? Let none without geometry enter. Bolo, it is at the entrance of Plato's Academy. Plato's Academy at the entrance. Let no one without geometry enter. Now identify this personality. An early education in anatomy shaped his philosophical outlook. This person was a native of Macedonia, a stalwart in the field of Western thought. This individual was interested in empirical observation of natural phenomena. Who is this personality? It is Aristotle. It is Aristotle. Got it, guys? Very good. Much of Aristotle's philosophy is a critique or extension of Plato's ideas. Is it true or false? This is only an introduction. 
Okay, today what I'm going to do is, I am going to teach you some criticism. Would you like that? We thought we will just introduce some ancient criticism and then we'll discuss modern criticism and tomorrow we will ask you questions about it. So much of Aristotle's philosophy is a critique or extension of Plato's ideas. True or false? Yes, it is true. Who believed that all things in the universe are in a state of flux? Everything is changing. You can never step into the same river twice, he said. Who is that? Who said you can never step into the same river twice? It is Heraclitus. Heraclitus. Heraclitus is also the person who said character is destiny. In which dialogue does Plato explore the concept of piety and justice? In which dialogue does Plato explore the concept of piety and justice? Is it apology? I am Euthyphro or Crito. Bolo. It is Euthyphro. Will you read extra about it? Piety and justice. Both Socrates and Plato accepted the morally incoherent vision of the universe. Universe it has no morality. As you see in Homer, it is disordered, irregular. Did Socrates and Plato accept it? No way. That is false. Socrates and Plato wanted a morally coherent universe, not disordered, not irregular. According to Plato, the familiar world of objects which surrounds us, which we apprehend by our senses is not independent and self-sufficient. Is it true or false? The familiar world of objects is not independent. Is true. It is not independent. It is dependent on the ultimate reality. It is ultimate on the conceptual reality. Plato's theory of forms challenges which strand of thought. Challenges which strand of thought. Plato is a rationalist. He challenges empiricism. Okay, who is associated with the myth of cave? These are all very simple questions just to remind you of everything. And now after this, I'm going to teach you, don't leave the session. Okay. Who is associated with the myth of cave? It is Plato. Which dialogue of Plato does not talk about poetry? Does not talk about poetry. Is it Phaedrus, Apology, Symposium or Sophist? It is Sophist. Please read extra. It is important. According to Plato, who are interpreters of interpreters? Interpreters of interpreters are the rhapsodies. Rhapsodies are people who sing the poems written by great poets like Homer. In the matter of divine inspiration of the poets, what does Plato compare the muse with? Plato compares the muse with a magnet. The muse is the magnet. The magnet attracts or the muse attracts the poet. The poet attracts the rhapsody like that. It is in rings, rings of influence are there. The muse is the magnet. Okay, now for Plato, even criticism is irrational and inspired. Is it true or false? Even criticism, both poetry and criticism are irrational for Plato. Plato's Republic is a dash. Is it a philosophical treatise, political tract, poetic composition or fictional piece? Obviously, it is a philosophical treatise or political tract below. It is a philosophical treatise. Sorry, guys, for this mistake. My team is taking things for granted. Sorry, but no problem. We'll correct it. Republic, by its end, alludes to an ancient quarrel. The quarrel is between dash and dash. Republic alludes to an ancient quarrel. What is that quarrel? It is between philosophy and poetry. Poetry and philosophy, that is very famous. Who talked about loving justice for its own sake? 
you have to love justice said socrates because socrates is speaking in republic socrates is a speaker in republic in the opening statement of his poetics aristotle proposes to examine poetry in itself true or false it is true aristotle is going to examine poetry in itself aristotle's poetics has often been analyzed in terms of its prescriptions for lyric it distinctions of epics is it prescribing what is a lyric is it showing distinctions on a, of a epic is it uh, commenting on plot and character aristotle's poetics has often been analyzed in terms of its prescriptions for lyric it descriptions of epic like this confusing questions will be there doesn't matter we we'll leave this uh, question and answers and i will explain things to you plato and aristotle we have talked about already let me now talk about longinus longinus lived at the end of the uh, may a, a, you know a great a greek period greek classicism led to the hellenistic period longinus lived at that time at that time roman empire is flourishing and uh, longinus is the author of peri hapsus or on the sublime in on the sublime longinus talks about great elevated style of poetry and that is called sublimity sublimity is something that excess in great authors and great readers and it is not there throughout the work it flashes forth at the right moments scatters everything like a thunderbolt and displays the power of the orator that is what sublimity is longinus says that there are five sources of the sublime what are the five sources of the sublime there are two innate sources and three acquired sources the two innate sources are grandeur of thought you should think great thoughts and you should have vehement passion grandeur of thought and vehement passion and also the three acquired sources are there schemata phrases and composition schemata is appropriate use of figures of speech phrases is appropriate diction and dignified composition all these will give sublimity or elevation to writing longinus distinguished between true sublime and false sublime true sublime shows that the human being is limited divine is greater false sublime talks about the human being as great that is false sublime okay all these are very important concepts sublimity is there in milton's grand style and uh, just before milton wrote paradise lost uh, joseph hall had translated on the sublime into english and grand style is a term discussed by matthew arnold and grand style is the style of milton milton's grand style is a book by christopher rix okay so before longinus in the roman classical period oh, longinus is in greek period in greece uh, there was horace horace wrote ars poetica where he employed aristotelian ideas and talked about poesis or subject matter of poetry poema or form of poetry and poeta or poet he talks about poetry as creative adaptation mimesis is creative adaptation uh, horace talks about decorum of plot and characterization decorum should be maintained he talks about organic unity and he says that the poet's inspiration must be controlled in the renaissance period in england uh, there were a group of uh, writers who wrote prose and also uh, criticism the most major among them was philip sidney philip sidney was not the only one there were many others george gascoigne george puttenham thomas wilson john check roger ascham etc philip sidney uh, also combined aristotelian ideas with plato's ideas 
Philip Sidney in defense of poesy or apology for poetry wrote in defense or justification of poetry. This was written against Stephen Gosson's school of abuse, which attacked the poetry. In Sidney's apology for poetry, he is first saying that poetry is universal. Poetry lasts longest. It is everywhere. And he is justifying poetry. Based on the Italian critics, Mintuorno, Scaliger and Castelvetro, Philip Sidney is dividing poetry into three. Religious poetry, philosophical poetry, and imaginative poetry, or the right and true kind of poetry. And the right and true kind of poetry is the imaginative kind, the creative kind. It is further divided into seven parts, seven kinds. There is heroic poetry, epic poetry. Actually, heroic and epic are similar, same, but he is distinguishing between the two. Tragic, elegiac pastoral, satiric, and comic. He also talks about how each of these is useful to human beings. He defines poetry as a speaking picture with its end to teach and delight. Philip Sidney uh, talks about poetry with a lot of respect. He was a classicist. He understood that poetry has great things to achieve. Poetry is greater than philosophy and history, like Aristotle also said. Another classicist of this time is Ben Johnson. Ben Johnson wrote Conversations with Drummond, Timber or Discoveries Made Upon Men and Matter. And Ben Johnson also wrote about Francis Bacon, about William Shakespeare, etc. As you know, Ben Johnson is a classicist and he was intolerant of the liberties taken by the poets. Like Sidney, Ben Johnson also defined the poet as a maker or fiener and he talked about appropriate style. Ben Johnson uh, was a friend of Shakespeare and he admired Shakespeare but he also criticized Shakespeare for writing too much. He once uh, exclaimed, if only Shakespeare had blotted out a thousand lines. Ben Jonson famously said, to judge of poets is the faculty of poets and not of all poets, but the best. So he is defining a critic here. Classicism triumphed in the Renaissance period and it reached its culmination in the neoclassicists Dryden and Johnson. Dryden lived in the time of the Restoration period when French classicism was a great influence on England. Dryden was inspired by Boileau, Corneille, Rapine, and also the classical masters. But Dryden admired Englishness or native element in literature. He wrote many critical works, but the most important of these are of dramatic poesy and preface to the fables. Of dramatic poesy is modeled on Plato's dialogues. Here four characters are sitting on a barge on the Thames and they are discussing various aspects of poetry. First, Crites supports the ancients and he is intolerant of rhyme. Then Eugenius supports the moderns. Lysidius supports the French and Neander supports modern English plays. Lysidius defines the play as a lively, just and lively representation of human nature. Neander does an examination of Ben Jonson's epicene or the silent woman. Neander supports the use of tragic comedy and violation of unities. Both these are actually anti-classical, but Dryden uh, admired the English writers who did this brilliantly. 
use of tragic comedy and violation of unities. He went against classicism in supporting uh, violation of unities and tragic comedy. In Preface to the Fables, Dryden gives a lengthy appreciation of Chaucer. Dryden says, Chaucer is a rough diamond that should be polished, there he shines. He uh, compares Chaucer to Ovid and Boccaccio. In of dramatic poesy, he had compared Shakespeare with Homer and Ben Jonson with Virgil. Dryden has also written on satire, on comedy, on uh, heroic play, etc. In Dryden's time, criticism was also seen in the works of Joseph Edison, Alexander Pope, and of course, Dr. Johnson. Dr. Johnson's most important critical works are Preface to the Dictionary, Lives of the Poets, and of course, Preface to Shakespeare, published in 1765. In Preface to Shakespeare, he praises Shakespeare for a just representation of general human nature. He believed that Shakespeare held a mirror up, a faithful mirror of manners and life. And he praised Shakespeare's use of tragic comedy and violation of unities like Dryden. But he also criticizes Shakespeare for his loose plots, for sacrificing virtue to convenience, for using too many puns and quibbles, and also for Shakespeare's anachronisms. Johnson makes a very famous statement against dramatic verisimilitude. Verisimilitude means drama is lifelike. Johnson makes a statement against it when he says, anyway, drama is delusion. If you can imagine one place, you can imagine several. So there is no need to maintain unities of time and place, he says. These are the neoclassicists against the neoclassicists who, who believed that poetry is higher than any other art form, there emerged the romantics. The romantics including William Wordsworth and S.T. Coleridge. William Wordsworth famously said in Preface to Lyrical Ballads that there is essentially no difference between the language of prose and the language of poetry. He showed that language should be written in the language of the common man in a state of vivid sensation. La poetry should be written in the language of common man in a state of vivid sensation. Poetry should be written about the ordinary everyday life of common people, of rustic people. Poetry should contain emotion. It is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings that result from emotions recollected in tranquility. When you see a scenery, you get some powerful feelings, then you recollect these powerful feelings, and once again, there is recrudescence or coming back of those powerful feelings, and then poetry is created. He said, poetry is the breath and finer spirit of all knowledge. It is the impassioned expression which is in the countenance of all science. Coleridge in Biographia Literaria defined imagination as against fancy. Imagination is of two kinds, primary and secondary. Primary imagination is universal. Everybody has it is in, involuntary, but secondary imagination is voluntary. Secondary imagination dissolves, diffuses, and dissipates in order to recreate. The theory of imagination of Coleridge was derived from the German romantics, Schlegel, Schleiermacher, and Schelling. It is also derived from Kant, who believed that imagination is assemblastic or a shaping power. Coleridge also upheld the view that a poem is an organic whole. He upheld the organic unity of a poem. Coleridge is an impressionistic critic 
who criticized a text based on his own subjective impressions. He is a romantic critic. And he is one of the first, he is the first modern Shakespearean critic. The posthumously published book, Lectures on Shakespeare and Other Poems, on Other Poets, is very important. Coleridge also wrote a lot of philosophical, spiritual prose such as aids to reflection, etc. So that is uh, Coleridge. Now, Shelley also wrote a defense of poetry where he defined imagination. He defined a poet as a nightingale. And uh, Shelley reflected on a lot of political and social aspects in relation to poetry. He said, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Keats also is a small critic because of his two concepts, negative capability and egotistical sublime. And he is actually a foresh for harbinger. He foreshadows T.S. Eliot in saying, in suggesting that the poet is a catalyst. Keats suggested that the poet is a catalyst, which later T.S. Eliot expanded on even though Eliot is a classicist and Keats is a romantic. The Victorian period in criticism is a period of confusion and dilemma. It is the Victorian period of Victorian compromise because there are many conflicting ideas that emerged in the Victorian period. On the one hand, there is a classicist and moralist, Matthew Arnold. There is a... Arnold's art for life's sake. It's a utilitarian perception of art upheld by uh, John Ruskin. Against which came art for art's sake. Art for art's sake is the idea that art is complete in itself. Autotelic. It does not need to reflect society or the author. Now, during this time, there were many other critics. Walter Pater is another. Thomas Carlyle. Then Henry James. Percy Lubbock. It was a very rich period. Even George Eliot, who wrote about realism. Matthew Arnold believed that literary criticism should move towards socio-ethnic criticism, cultural criticism. He defined culture as the study of perfection. He believed that the function of criticism is, the, um, is to propagate the best that is known and thought in the world. He had a very elitist conception of culture and criticism. Now, the Victorian age leads to the modern age of which the stalwart is T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot, as you all know, is the author of Tradition and the Individual Talent, the English metaphysical poets, Hamlet and his problems, where he expounded very important concepts like tradition, impersonality theory, objective correlative, unification of sensibility, etc. For Eliot, who began as a new critic, tradition is very important. His friend F.R. Leavis had written the great tradition. Eliot wrote the wasteland starting from Homer down to the present time, connecting everything, you know, a heap of broken images connected through a cinematographic technique, connected through the protagonist Tiresias using the mythical method. Eliot believed that the modernist writer should use the mythical method in order to give a shape and a significance to the immense panorama of futility and anarchy that is contemporary history. Eliot was a friend of the new critics or the practical critics as they are called in England. In England, in Eliot's time, in Cambridge, there were practical critics, I.A. Richards, William Empson, and F.R. Lewis. They inspired the American new critics, 
in the 1940s and 50s. And new criticism became a very important formalist movement that transformed the academy. Academy means the universities. And new criticism believed in the autotelic text and close reading. Do not look at anything outside the text. Why did they believe like, why did they think like that? Because the times were very bad. There was a lot of fragmentation and confusion in that age. There was nothing out there in the society. So they were desperately trying to, to, to find refuge within the text. So were the myth critics. Myth critics, Leslie Fiedler, Richard Chase, Maud Botkin, uh, Northrop Fry. The myth critics were also trying to give a shape and a significance to this panorama of anarchy that is contemporary history. And then, why all these things were happening, the Second World War happened. The First World War was disastrous enough. The Second World War completely destroyed everything in the Western world. There was no going back. There is a new world that began after that. Literary criticism slowly gave way to literary theory. Even then, at this time in the 20th century, criticism remained in the works of critics like Emma H. Abrams, Frank Kermode, Kenneth Burke, Lionel Trilling, etc. And literary theory began to take over from the 1950s and 60s. So, did you like that short and crisp introduction? Are you ready to do an amazing quiz based on all this tomorrow? Promise me you'll read extra study and come because it will immensely help you. I hope you enjoyed this discussion of criticism. I hope you got a very clear idea. Uh, if you liked, give me some hearts. I want a lot of red, 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 red hearts. See, here, I have given you hearts. Please watch this video again. Take notes, okay? When you watch this video two, three times, you will automatically remember. It is not difficult. Don't worry. And I will bring you more questions and answers. All right, guys. So that is me signing off for now. Meet you again tomorrow with some amazing questions. Until then, God bless you. Bye-bye. What are you all chatting? Thank you. Thank you. Right. Oh, my God. I've got some love from Czech Republic. And they're also studying from our videos. Thank you so much. I am so deeply touched. Huh. I know that you are all loving the videos and using them well, learning from it. That is why I am taking a lot of effort. We are all, my entire team is helping me, taking a lot of effort. Uh, even if I'm not feeling well, even if I'm feeling sleepy, I will come and do this if I can, because I know you will be waiting. And I value your time and appreciation and love and support so much. So very much. It is important to us. Please like the video, uh, subscribe and share with your friends. Please help us uh, like we are helping you. Okay.